she's the Rebbe Shlita, the other Rosh Hashivas, Rabbi Kresh, Mati Goldstein, and my Tyra Mama, we call her Bobby Hentro, and my wife, and my children that I hear, and my grandchildren that I hear, and the Hashem, my great grandchildren will be here also. I have a lifetime contract with Nava Minsk. I'm an accountant. I'm in business. Ikim Tamir, why am I even involved in this? There's thousands of other people my age. What? So a couple of years ago, as an introduction to tell you how all this started, a couple of years ago, I was asked to go on a tour uh, with Rabbi Ephraim Goldstein, who's a, a Rav in Boca Raton, Florida. And he put together a tour of 40 people, and we went to Poland, not to Kiv, uh, Kivrit Sadikim, we went, it was called a Holocaust tour, to basically see the poil, to see what transpired. And while I was there, one day after the next day, he spoke in a little town called Tikten, to coach him. I'm sure nobody ever heard of it, I didn't. I'm sure the Rosh Hashivas here probably heard of that town. It's a small little town. There's not one Jew living there today. There is a Besmedrish that was built in, in the 1600s. But just for you to know what kind of town it was, uh, some of the Rabbonim that were there, the Magina Shloima, the Shagas Arya, the El Yoraba, the Maser Akeach, and the Pnei Yeshua and his son, they were Rabbonim in that little town called Tikten or Tokocha. So it, once upon a time it was the Irvain Bisrul, and in that particular town, we went into the Bismedrish, uh, to Dab Mincha, and the tour guide, the rabbi, said uh, a vart, which really grabbed me and said, you must act. And in order for you all to have this fire in you to see what has to be done, um, I want to take this opportunity to show you, it's only an eight minute clip, what I saw, and hopefully it's going to have the shpoh on you as it had on me. An immigrant survivor. And the man turned to Rabbi Fass and he summoned all of his strength on his deathbed and he said to Rabbi Fass, Ich gehen tanzen mit dem Malachen. I'm going soon to dance with the angels. And the rabbi thought to a moment this uncomfortable comment, what exactly did it mean? And he just assumed it meant the man understood and anticipated that he was nearing his end. And so he said to the old man, Yes, it's, it's beautiful. You've led a virtuous life. Certainly you're worthy of the world to come. Undoubtedly, you will soon be dancing with the angels. And the man said, no. Why were they being rounded up? Why were their lives being interrupted? What was happening? And where were they going? Somehow he was under the impression they were about to go on a trip. They were about to undertake a journey. But it was... Chalamoid Sukkis, maybe it was Shmini Atzeris, it was certainly right before Simchas Torah. And the eight year old Moshele, his favorite day of the year that he looked forward to, that he counted down towards, was Simchas Torah. So little Moshele began to pull on his father's pant leg at the roundup. And he said, Mechemesh Tansen on Simchas Torah? If we go on this trip, if we go on this journey, we're going to miss the dancing. I love Simchas Torah, the candies and tying up the talisim and dancing in the circles around and around. We can't go now. If we go on this trip, we're going to miss the dancing. And Simchas Torah, but his father kept saying to little Moshua, Shash still, shh, be quiet, stop talking. But Moshua was insistent, Tata, we're going to miss the dancing. We'll go later, we don't have to go now, what are we doing here? His father just kept trying to quiet him, shash do. Why are you talking? An SS guard overheard Mashula. And he said to him, Tansen, Tansen, you want to dance? And he yanked him by the collar, this little boy. And he drew him out of the whole lineup. 
And he proceeded to grab another young boy and then another young boy and a fourth little boy. And he took the four boys in front of the whole town that had been gathered, had been round up. And he said to the four boys who were scared at that moment out of their minds, the SS guard turned to him and he said, Tanz, dance. And the four boys didn't know what to do. So they joined hands. And the four of them formed a circle. And though there was certainly no music playing, to the absolute silence of the whole town watching, the four boys held hands. And they began to dance. They began to dance. The guard, the Nazi, who was entertaining himself, was humored, took out his revolver, and he pointed it to one of the four boys. Bang! He shot one of the four boys who fell, who dropped to the ground, who had been killed. The three boys stood there frozen solid, and the Nazi turned to them and he said, Tanz! Dance! And now the three took hands, frightened, and though there was no music, complete silence began to dance in a circle. And again, the Nazi, amused, entertained, took out his gun, his revolver, pointed at one of the little boys, pulled the trigger, boom! And another of the boys fell to the ground, murdered. And now there were two boys. And the SS guard, who was still entertained, said to them, Tanz, dance! And now he took his gun and one of the two little boys, again, laughing out loud, he pointed his revolver, pulled the trigger, bang! The third boy fell to the ground, murdered in front of the entire town, his family, everybody watching. And now, there was only one boy standing, eight-year-old Maishala. He was petrified. He didn't know what was going to happen next. And the SS guard said to him, No, Tanz, you wanted to dance so badly? Dance! Moshe was confused and he was petrified. He was now standing there alone. And he didn't know what to do. So he turned his palms towards the heavens. And he began to by himself, he began to dance as if it was Simcha's Torah. And the SS guard, rather than laugh, was bewildered. And he looked to little Moshele and he said, what are you doing? And Moshele looked up at him and he said, I'm dancing with the Malachim. I'm dancing with the angels. The SS guard dancing with the angels? And he grabbed little Moshele by the collar, enraged. And he said, get out of my face, you foolish little boy. And he threw him back into the crowd among the entire town who had gathered. And as this man lay on his deathbed at the end of his life, Rabbi Fast turned to him and he said, what happened, what happened next? What happened to the boy? And the elderly man looked at him and he said, that little boy, that little boy survived the war. And every single year for the rest of his life, wherever he was living, wherever, when Simcha's Torah came, the whole shul gathered because they knew at some point, at some point on that yantif, at some point in that dancing, there was an old man who was going to go into the middle of the circle without explanation and without warning by himself with his palms facing to the heavens and he was going to start dancing. And the sick man then looked at Rabbi Fast and he told him with a smile, I am Moshe. And yet, now, now I am going to really dance with the angels, with the Malachim. We have the privilege of singing and dancing whenever we want and wherever we want. At the many simchas that we attend in our communities on Simchas Torah, on different Yom Tovim throughout the year, no revolvers are pointed our way. No one limits or precludes our ability to share our simcha as loudly and enthusiastically as we can. We have that ability when so many others no longer do. And in the memory of this older man, Moshe, Moshele, and in the memory of the thousands who lived in this little shtetl of Tekochen, 
who all that's left is this shul, the Magid David on the home next door, who that tefillah on the back wall in which we pray that our nightmares not come true, and unfortunately theirs did, in all of their memory, join me in bringing this shul back to life. Join me for a time. I heard this word, Magai Tansum in the Malocha. It inspired me because only a Malach can dance with the Malocha. This survivor, Moshe, as well as my father, my mother, my father in law, my mother in law, where whole Mishpuchas were wiped out. These are the malocha. I never realized at that time what kind of malach my father was. I'm not here to talk, give a talk about my own parents, although I'll mention a couple of examples. But what I want to make you aware, last week we had a tragedy where 45 people never were killed. Does anybody here know that 76 years ago, like Boimer, 10,000 plus Yidin were burned in Auschwitz? In the period from like Boimer, about 50 days, 53 days, in 1944, 53 days, 500,000 Hungarian Jews were burned in the crematoriums in Auschwitz, plus I'm sure many other nationalities. That happened 76 years ago. We don't know the people that were killed in Auschwitz. We never had the opportunity to meet them. I never met my grandfather. All I had left was one grandmother called Baba Rochel. We were left with the survivors. And I think it's due time, as time goes by, to start talking about the survivors. Some of you have Zaydis that are survivors. Some of you have Zaydis that are children of survivors. Some of you have Zayd, had Elter Zaydis who were survivors. You each have a connection to a survivor. How much do you know about them? What do you know about them? What kind of people they were? I was in Budapest a couple of times. And there's, this, there's a river there going through. It's called the Danube. It's called the Duna. And somebody went to ask Rabitzikl, I think, in, in Belgium, a prostitute. And he said to him, we say in Avini Malkainis, we say, Aseilaman harigim al shem kachechu, Aseilaman tavichim al yechidechu. Rebbe, what does this mean? What's the difference what, 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 what does this mean? So the Rebbe said, I don't know, you have a pshat? He says, yeah, I have a pshat. Let me give you my pshat. By the Duna in Hungary, in Budapest, in those times, they used to line up people by the river with their back facing the river. They made them take off their shoes and the Nazis were standing there, and the Hungarians also. They were also, some of them were even worse than the Nazis. And they started shooting, and the people fell over, and they fell into the, into the Danube River, to the Duna. My mother, when I went with her, Zazan Gazin, she said they used to call it the Reute Duna, the Red Duna, because it was so bloody. But as the Nazis started 
shooting, everybody started saying, Shema Yisrael. So let's say there were 50 people or 100 people lined up. The first part were only able to say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeini. That's the Arigim Hashem Kachechu. The last 50 were able to finish it and say, Hashem Alekeini Hashem Echad. Those are the, the Tavichim Al Yichedechu on, the, on Echad. So not everybody was even able to say the Shema Yisrael. That's how it was in those days. This is just a taste of what I've seen and what I've heard. But now let's talk a little bit about the survivors. Talk a little bit about my, my family. My father of Asholem, his whole yeshiva, time that he spent time in the yeshiva was two and a half years. And then he had to run away because they wanted to put him in the army and that was certain death. He went to Bergen-Belsen, which was a war camp, not, an, not a, um, an extermination camp. In Bergen-Belsen, it's known the old Satmar Rebbe was in Bergen-Belsen. Uh, it was a war camp. His job, his job at that time, he was hooked up to a wagon and he worked in a quarry where they dig rocks and he used to schlep up the rocks in the wagon like a horse. Schlep them up the mountain, come down with the empty wagon, that's what he did all day. My father used to tell me it was two people were schlepping and if one of them was strong, his job was half, half as hard. But if the other one's never halter and starben, he didn't have any help. He really had to work very hard to schlep, to schlep it. I have my office hanging. I saw a picture of that. It's, I can't see if it's my father or not, where the Yidna Mamish hooked up to the wagon, a load of quarry rocks, taking rocks, and schlepping up the mountain. This is what he did for a period of two and a half years. He never spoke about the Holocaust, except Pesach at night. Why Pesach at night? He had the family around him. He used to tell stories of what happened. He didn't, he didn't talk much about it. He was a plain, plain Ayid. You know, he went to Yeshiva. He, 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 um, I can't say he was this big London and everything else. But I remember as a kid, to him it was very chush of mitzvah matzahs, ere pesach matzahs. So when I was a little child, they used to bake mitzvah matzahs, it cost a dollar a piece. Today it's six for a hundred dollars, but then it was a dollar a piece. And he never, he wanted to have it, but he couldn't afford the six dollars. He probably wanted it because by his father it was very chush of. So he hired himself out to a bakery for five hours, he was a good Velger, he, he was very good, made very nice matzahs. He worked five hours air of Pesach in order to get six matzahs to be able to bring for, for his Seder. And I remember my mother always used to tell him, you're going to make matzahs, why aren't you home helping me with the kids? You know, there were four small children in the house, but that was his thing, that's how Hush of it was there. This story is told over many times, I, I told it to the Rebbe uh, on Sunday, he had chemotherapy, and they stick you with a lot, of, a lot of needles. And he always told the nurse he prefers this hand, because it hurts him less. And they used to stick him in his hand. And once the nurse told him, she said, you know, I don't have any veins anymore where to stick you. Why don't you use the other hand? The other hand is always hurts me. At the end, he told my brother, my brother told him, why are you, why are you doing this? He said, Tvil, I want to put on. I put on Twill on the left hand, let them stech the right hand as much as they want. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. This is what I want to do. This is a plain Ayid. A push at the plain Ayid. Nishkan Ruv, Nishkan, he's not a Rosh Yeshiva, he's not a Rebbe, he's not a Rebbe's kind, nothing. A plain a push at the Yid. In some way, this is a picture of a survivor. You're not going to be able to pinpoint and say where it comes from, but they, they had this ingrained. Voraya comes out of a, a war, 
loses his entire family, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. He had left one sister who was holed up in a Red Cross hospital in Switzerland because she was beaten by a Nazi. And he could have said, what do I need this for? Not only that, I just reminded myself, we had some modern cousins, my mother's cousins, who came out in, in the 30s. And by the time they came here ready, they were Zoy Melchig and Fleischig. And when my father put me into Chsan Seufer, his cousin, his name was Ernie, was very, a very nice man, a Greta Heimish Yiddish, you know, he was, a, he was probably at that time still a Shtikl Shem Shabbos. He says to my father, Wo's Geist in the yeshiva, shikes the kinder in the yeshiva, hypes to noch, we're starting again the same thing as we started before. This is America, and in America you got to go to school, you got to learn English, you got to go to college, you got to do all these things. Of course, my father wouldn't listen to him. And he always used to, he always used to uh, tease my father and say, Fendana, kinder, from your kids, nothing will grow up, nothing. My kids go to public school. Yeah, I send them once uh, an hour a week to Hebrew school, but what do you need this America? You have to give up the whole war. Look what happened to you. So I remember, um, this is just from memory, when I became a CPA in 1974, I got my license, and I called my father to tell him I passed the exam. My father says to me, Mahmoud a copy, make me a copy of your, of your license. So I made him a copy. Didn't know what this was all about. He probably wanted some bragging rights he wanted to have. My mother told me two, three days later, you know what, uh, you know what your father did? He took, a dr uh, took the train to Bay Parkway. This Ernie had a, had a jewelry store on Bay Parkway. And he took it to Ernie to show him, my son is a CPA. He's a Shiva Bucher, what you made fun. Your son is a customs agent in JFK. And he told him, you know what's going to happen? My son is going to go to Europe on business to handle a very big business and come back and your educated son is going to open his valise to check what he has in there. <laughs> this was my father, a survivor. My mother, Zazan Gazint, she has a lot of stories to tell and what we did which everybody should do if they can, even with Holocaust survivor children to do this. We sat down and my son Avrumi interviewed her. We put a CD together for an hour and 40 minutes and she told us stories growing up during the war, coming to America, how difficult it was. And I heard mo most of the stories, but one story I didn't hear. And she reminded me this story while I was sitting outside. My mother says to me one day, you know why I have such nachas for my kids? Why they're so good to me? Let me tell you what I did during the war for Baba Ruchel, her mother. During the war, my mother was, uh, she, um, she pretended to be a, a shiksa. She had a dark complexion, and she lived like a shiksa, so nobody bothered her in Budapest. My grandmother, Fernanda Gescheit, my grandmother was also in Budapest, she lived in one of the Wallenberg houses. Do any of you know what a Wallenberg house is? I'll tell you. Raoul Wallenberg, a goy, he gave out Swedish uh, citizenship papers to hundreds of thousands of, of people. And when they had that, they were a neutral country. The uh, Nazis could not touch them. So he had a house, a lot of houses in Budapest, and my grandmother lived there, but they didn't come with food. They just had, so the Baba never, she was almost dead from starvation. She couldn't have what to do. What my mother did is she went around collecting whatever she found in the garbage cans, a little piece of cloth, a tablecloth, or this or that. And she went to the train station, didn't go into the train because it was full of Nazis, she was afraid. She went on top of the train and rode to the nearest town, every time a different town, and she went knocking door to door to door to sell her shmatas that she had. And when she knocked on the door, the, the woman comes out and says, yeah, we, we have no money. So my mother said, I don't need money. Give me bread. That's all I need. 
So this is a galungan, she sold her things, she had a loaf of bread, she came back on the train, went to my mother, threw it into a window, and my mother, my grandmother had what to eat for a week. The Messias neighbors that she had to go on a train and not fall off and whatever, I said, and that's his, she was able to see Doris. As a matter of fact, when it was her 90th birthday, we made for her a, a birthday party, and we all, there was a stage, and all the Einikluch and Ir Einikluch got on the stage. She had 123 uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, children on that stage, and the photographer wanted to do something cute. He told her not to go on the stage, you stay downstairs under the stage and point. Say something. So my mother, she probably forgot, my mother is standing there, pointing at the stage, and the photographer says, say something. All she said was, Hitler. That's her nakuma. That Hitler at Gewalt Osra wanted to, to exterminate everybody, and look what she has. This is what she's thankful for. My Baba Ruchel, who lost her husband in, in the war, was an Almuna from uh, 1945 until when she died in, uh, in um, uh, something like 1990, I think. Uh, just to appreciate her, she was a little lady. All my friends knew my grandmother because that was my favorite person because my mother had three jobs and she was always not home and my grandmother used to take care of us. She had the following minig. I don't know if the Rebbe is going to approve of the minig. I know where she took it from. She washed in the morning, ate breakfast, a big breakfast, and she benched at night. How did she bench? She sat down by the window, so the bench, so the Krishna Galait, and then she had a, a, a conversation with Hashem. I never got the opportunity to tape it. I mean, if you guys would have heard, Taira Bashefa, and she went on and on and on. Lomach Nach Ein Yur Leib, Ein Yur Beit Shasach Beit Ein Yur. So I said, Bobby. Who's based at the Beit Shanya? Beit Shan, Tzayn Yur. Metunish Sifel Beit. Morgen, Elch Vidr Zugn, Gemma Noch Ein Yur. And Ibe Morgen, next to Sifel Chorzun, Gemma Noch Ein Yur. This was her way of thinking. When she was 92, 93 years old, she weighed maybe 70 pounds. She was very schwach. It's Gekim and Yom Kippur. I went to my Rebbe, Kasharuv, and I asked the child, Who's, who's that the Baba do team it? And fasten. You know, it's very difficult. She was in shul all day. Is that not fast noch? I mean, she barely can breathe. So the Rebbe said, he said as a joke, he said, You don't have to adhere to everything the Shulchan Uruch says when you're over 90. So the Nehmer and I have climbed Bronfenglazel and they can drink them and they schwach, a bit of cake, a bit of dust. I feel as a fast and shows, it's not a good thing. I come with the Simcha, to my grandmother. I said, Bobby, the Rebbe had gesucht, and they can't in a Bronfenglazel, they can't drink, and they can't orange juice drink, and they Taka? The Rebbe had so gesucht? Timra Toiva, she says. Guide to the Rebbe, go to the Rebbe, and tell him, Rebbe, when die es nicht fasten, er liegt auch nicht fasten, lo mich wissen, wenn die es trinken von a Bronfenglazel, er liegt auch trinken von a Bronfenglazel. My father-in-law left in the war a wife and five kids. Never, ever did he speak about it. Never. When he died, we wanted to get the names on the back of the Matzaiva, that's the minig that you do. It was even very hard for us to get all those names together because Hardly anybody knew we got his wife's name and maybe one or two of his kids. Never ever spoke about it. It's like, it's like the war never happened. He carried on. Carried on like normal. I grew up in a house, although it was poor, it was poor, but there was no screaming, no yelling. The house was normal. We had a normal chinuch. 
We grew up to be fine, upst upstanding uh, individuals. Today, I always say this by Sheva Bruchas, are you, you guys aren't buying cars yet, but you'll find the younger man, he, he leases a car, but he wants to have 10 leather seats. And an imglikliche thing happens to him. The car by mistake comes with black leather seats. That guy is depressed for three months. He has to take medication to get over it. This is today's dar. We have to learn from the old dar. Look at what they went through and they were still, most of them were still normal, normal people. There was once a taxi driver driving a car service whose goal in life was to write a Sefer Torah and give it into a shul. 50 years he's saving, never went on vacation, he saved a dollar on a dollar on a dollar until he was able to do this. By the Suda there, he's sitting with, with uh, the rabbi of the shul and whatever, and finally the rabbi turns to him and he says, look, I, it's a very, very nice thing to have a Sefer Torah, it's a very nice thing, but, but, a whole life you go for, what's in this thing about the Sefer Torah? Tells him, I'll tell you a story. I was in one of the concentration camps, could have been Treblinka, it could have been, you know, whichever concentration camp. And in the morning I get up and I put on my shoes, those are the shoes that, that the Nazis gave you, it was made out of paper and, and, uh, and, and wood, because the first thing they did is they took the shoes away from you. And he takes a look and he sees in the sole, Parmet, from a Sefer Torah. He sees it. He says, my God, how can I step into these shoes? But on the other end, if I don't wear shoes, I get a blister, I get an infection, and I die. He's a taxi driver. That I'm doing such a bazoyim for the Sefer Torah, that I'm stepping on it while I'm working, I promise you one day I'm going to write a Sefer Torah so you should forgive me for this Aveda that I did. This is a survivor. We went to a museum in Budapest and we saw an item which was found in Auschwitz. A Hanukkah menorah made out of bread. The bread was hard. They made a hole in it. So it had eight candles and then it had a shamas, nine pieces of bread. Do you know what it means to give away nine pieces of bread to light a Hanukkah menorah? I don't know if our generation would do that. It's in the museum piece, something like this. The Mesiris Nefesh that these people had, some of them could be survivors, most of them are probably not even survivors, but we gotta talk about them. Like the Rebbe said, and Rav Kresh said, when these Yidin came to America with nothing, there was very schwach Yiddishkeit in America in those days, very schwach. They used to call it the Golden of Medina. But when they came to America, they strengthened themselves and they started forming yeshivas, Beis Yaakovs, shuls, uh, all kinds of things. What we're seeing today that everybody talks about, the strength of tzedakah and the strength of Torah that is being learned today, that's all a result of, all, of these people. Had these survivors not come to America, or had they decide not to be Yiddish anymore, and who could have blamed them, Yiddishkeit wouldn't look this way. Somebody came to the Burchel, the Minkacha. The Burchel was an item of the old Minkacha. He was a Reuven Chilon in Israel. And asked him the following thing, following Shaila. He said to him, six million people died al Kiddush Hashem. That's a known fact. The Pshat of Kiddush Hashem is to show your Lipshaf of Hashem is Burch. He asked that Grobe Shala, why does Hashem need so much Lipshaft? If 10,000 people would have killed themselves, would have gotten killed in the war, it's not enough to show how Yidin 
Love Hashem is Burakh. A hundred thousand people, a million people. Why does Hashem need one million times six? Like I told you, 10,000 people got killed each day. Today, also, 76 years ago. So he answered him, he said to him, let me explain something to you. None of the six million people died al Kiddush Hashem. Why? To die al Kiddush Hashem means you're given an option. You're given a choice. Other ways to, either you shmad yourself, or we kill you. You had a choice. You could have shmad yourself, and then they wouldn't kill you. We all know that in German, by the Germans, if you were one sixteenth Jewish, not Jewish, not even half Jewish, not even a quarter Jewish, a sixteenth Jewish, you died just like anybody else. You had no choice. The fact that you were Jewish, you went straight to the oven, whatever they were able to do. They're Kedoshim, because they died as Jews, but they didn't die Al-Kiddush Hashem. You know who's dying and who died and who's going to die Al-Kiddush Hashem? Each and every one of the survivors that we were able to see. Why? Because when they came out of the war with nothing, and they were sent to this country and that country, they could have saved, look at the trouble it brings. Look at all the people that got killed because of it. I'm going off the derech, I'm going to not even identify myself as, as many, many people did do, unfortunately. They have an option. They could have said, goodbye. They chose the option of being an El Chayid. That's called Kiddush Hashem. They lived Al Kiddush Hashem, and they died Al Kiddush Hashem. And those few survivors that are left, Bishindit and Swan Segur, they are going to die Al Kiddush Hashem. That's the generation where we're coming from. So my message to the Navaminsky yeshiva, to any yeshiva, to any Beis Yaakov is, start getting familiar with who your Zaydis, Elta Zaydis, Babas, Elta Babas were. What kind of Yidin they were. What kind of Maluchim they were. Because they're really going up to dance with the Malochim. Don't forget about them. When you have a chance, talk to the survivors. Or if the survivors are not there, talk to the children of survivors. We're the closest one. We heard all the stories firsthand. Talk to them. Find out who they are. I hope that books are going to be written about survivor stories, not stories about the Holocaust. We have a lot of that. But little chapters. This man, he did this. This man, he did that. This woman did that. They were Makad Hashem Shemayim by behaving the way they were. I have no other way of saying this except I beg of you. Let's not forget, we're living in dangerous times. Ayid has to know, chas v'shulm, it can happen again. We won't be able to withstand something like this. If we remember, if we talk about it, if their midas toivas that you find out that they had is ingrained in you, on top of all your learning, and davening and everything else. I always tell my kids, you cannot know where you're going unless you know where you're coming from. And fortunately for us, even though we're coming from two generations ago of this big harbin that happened, we still had the survivors to learn from. They are and were the Maluchim of our Dar. Sha'al Avichu Biagetchu. Thank you. It's hard to find the words to thank for this. So much to benefit, to take, to absorb. 
And in Mir Tzashem, we're going to continue to work on this. Takis Choyr Val Tishkach in Mir Tzashem. I'd like to ask the Vokram to be Messiah. <coughs> Such a beautiful Maimed with the a two minute nigg of Animam. Animam. Ben Shon, the Friedman family, from Mr. Friedman's as I gesund, from Zoycher sein, zusammen mit den Saal und Kegengeim Meshich, zit keinu gesund der Heit, from Heir Rabbi Amenu Amen, and specifically the, uh, Mrs. Friedman and Shal Noach's mother is on sein gesund, Leirach Yom and Vishon and Toivim and Kegengeim Meshich gesund der Heit.